Hey, I'm so glad that you are with us today. If we haven't met, my name is Eric. I'm the senior pastor here at Mariners Church. Welcome to Mariners Online. We are about to start this week, and this is for you, Mariners Online, an online session of Rooted. Rooted is really important to our church. It's a 10-week Bible study that will help you know your purpose, know who God is, and, and get connected to some other people. We are offering Rooted with Mariners Online in multiple time zones this session. So just go to the link on the bottom of your screen. If you haven't been through Rooted yet, I'm inviting you to go through this 10 weeks, 10 weeks, come on, you can do it. It'll make a massive impact in your life. All right, this weekend we are teaching, we are kicking off a teaching series called Losing It. And we wanna lose the grip that anger has on our lives. And I'm assuming I'm not the only one that has a complex relationship with anger. I mean, I've wrestled. I'm assuming you have as well with anger at times in your life. And I read some articles that say, hey, you, you can't suppress anger. There's research in the past that says, don't suppress your anger, let it out. Because if you suppress it, then one day you'll just explode. Don't suppress. But in recent years, there's been new research that says, if you express your anger, it will only make you more angry. So if I'm not to suppress and I'm not to express, what do I do? We'll talk about that during this teaching series. As a Christian, I've had a complex relationship with anger because I read in the scripture that there's this thing known as righteous anger. So there's this unrighteous anger. I know I've had that. And then there's righteous or holy anger. And really it's the only struggle that I can think of in my life that the word righteous is sometimes placed in front of. I mean, no one goes around saying I've got righteous lust or righteous jealousy or righteous pride. Yeah, I got pride. I got pride in my life, bro, but it's the righteous kind. I mean, no, no one says that, but we say there's a righteous anger. How do we know the difference between unrighteous anger in our lives that destroys us and righteous anger that can be helpful? We'll talk about that in this teaching series. And I've had a complex relationship with anger from when I first became a Christian because I would read verses in the scripture that tell me God is angry. And before we can really talk about some of these other issues related to our anger, I mean, if we're gonna approach the scripture as a thinking person, we probably wanna wrestle with, wait a second, there's verses in the Bible that say our God is angry. I mean, I remember stumbling over verses in the scripture when I first became a Christian that verses like this, Exodus 32, verse 10. Now leave me alone, this is God speaking, so that my anger can burn against them and I can destroy them, then I will make you into a great nation. Numbers 32, verse 13, the Lord's anger burned against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years. First Kings 16, 13, angering the Lord God of Israel with their worthless idols. And then Proverbs chapter six, verse 16 through 19, things that God hates, the Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimonies, and anyone who stirs up trouble among brothers. Wow, I have done almost all of the things on that list. The Lord is angered, he burns with anger. The Lord hates, whoa, look at these verses. I mean, we wrestle with, we know God is gracious and loving, but. He's angered, we read clearly in the scripture. And one of the reasons that we flinch when we read that God is angered is because in our lives, we rarely see examples of good anger. We've only seen, seen anger that destroys. And, and we know, and you're gonna see in the scripture today that God is not this, this boss who's on a tirade and he's just screaming at people. He's not an angry dad who is never satisfied, who's always frustrated. This is not who God is. He's actually a gracious and good father who is angered at times. 
In fact, what, what would you say, what would you think if I tried to convince you that God being angry is a gift to you? That God being angry is good for you? That God being angry, that we have a God who gets angered is actually really good for you. It is. It's good for you because his anger reminds you of his love for you. See, anger is not the opposite of love. Hate is not the opposite of love. What's the opposite of love is indifference. And God is never indifferent towards you. He's never apathetic towards you. And because he loves you, he's angered at what destroys you. And he hates what ruins you because he loves you. God is angered at things that pull you away from real life. And I know this as a dad, my daughter, Eden, my oldest, when she was a child, she had this this pediatric neurological disorder known as pandas, which really attacked her, her, her brain, her mind for a season in our life. And I hated pandas. I was angry at pandas, at this neurological disorder that was impacting my daughter. I hated it. I was angry at it because it was hurting the one I love so much. So God is not apathetic towards you. He's angered at things that destroy you. He hates what ruins you because he loves you. His anger is not the opposite of his love. His anger flows from his fierce and great love for you. It's also a gift that God is angered because this reminds us that one day God is going to make everything that's broken and wrong with this world right and brand new. That he is angered at things in this world that are harmful. He's angered at the injustices and oppression. He's angered by those things. And we're glad he's angered because that lets us know one day those will be no more. See, God was not angered until sin entered the world. Before sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden, when everything was perfect, God was not angered, but sin entered the world and the injustices and the oppression that brings damage to people. That is what angered and still angers God. It's like me, I'm having a great day until I'm at an airport in a long line. The long line (laughs) brings the anger out. God, not angry until the oppression and injustice in the world brought out the anger because of his great love for people. And the fact that God gets angry is actually a comfort to us that one day everything will be made right. Mirsal Volf is a professor at Yale and he grew up in Croatia. And he says, if you don't like the idea that God gets angry, then it's because you've grown up in quiet suburbia and you haven't had challenges, deep challenges in your life. But if you grew up in Croatia as he did and you live in a war torn zone and you see your family murdered or people you love raped, you want God to be angry who will one day make everything right. And he will, he will. So God's anger reminds us that we won't live forever in this broken world. And God's anger reminds us of what he did to remove our sin and our shame from us. Those of us who believe in Jesus, his anger reminds us of what he did to make us his. And so, As we begin a teaching series on losing it, on overcoming the grip of anger, we wanna see how God addressed his anger. You're gonna learn a lot. This will actually be a foundation for the rest of the teaching series. You're gonna learn that God did not sweep his anger under the rug. He didn't suppress it, but he's also not constantly running around expressing it. He addressed his anger very intentionally. And this is a gift for you and a gift for me. We're gonna look at several verses in Romans chapter three today. Some scholars, people who study the Bible say these verses really give you a snapshot of the whole message of the Bible. So look with me, this is the word of the Lord. But now, Romans 3, 21, but now apart from the law, righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. Okay, so, 
apart from the commands of God in the Old Testament, which none of us have been able to keep, the law and the prophets were pointing to one who would make us right with God. We can't make ourselves right with God. We desire to be right with God. We could not pull it off. So the law and the prophets were pointing to one who would come, Jesus, and he's the only way that we can be right with God. Next verse. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In this passage, you see a bad all and a good all. The bad all, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us have been perfect. All of us have angered him because we've fallen short of his holiness. All of us have. But also there's a good all in the passage that salvation, forgiveness is available to everyone, to all who believe. There's no distinction. God's not looking at one person and saying, oh, you don't need to believe in me to become forgiven. You don't need to, you're good enough. No, everyone has fallen short. There's no distinction. And there's no distinction on how we are forgiven. We're only forgiven through Jesus Christ. All right, these next couple of verses are gonna show us what God did with his anger towards our sin for those of us who believe in him. And these verses are so weighty and they're so beautiful. We're gonna highlight a couple of words that I'm gonna emphasize and I hope you press in. If you're new to exploring the Christian faith, these verses will help you understand what Jesus is all about for you. They are justified freely. So all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him, Jesus, as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him, Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, let me explain what this passage is teaching. We know that throughout human history, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Throughout human history, God is just, he is holy. And because we've all fallen short of the glory of God, God's anger burned against all sin that has ever been committed. Now this verse says, from the time humans history began until the time of Jesus, that God in his restraint passed over the sins of people. He, he held his anger until a moment in human history where he unleashed all of his anger on one sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus, God the Son on the cross for us. Now, now, some struggle with this. Some have said to me, Eric, I, I, I don't like this idea of a God who, who punished God the Son, Jesus, on the cross. Why would it have to be that way? Well, understand that God is holy. And because he's holy, all of our sin is a deep violation of his character. And because he's holy, sin has to be punished. God doesn't sweep it under the rug. He just doesn't cast it away. No, there, there has to be a price paid for our treason against this holy God. And if you believe that, well, of course, that there's going to have to be a payment for this sin, then you're just going to be grateful because you realize you aren't the one who pays for your sin, that all of your sin was placed on Jesus, that all of the anger and the wrath of God he didn't suppress it. He doesn't go around expressing it. He addressed it in Jesus on the cross for us. Notice in the verse we read that Jesus is both just, so he's holy, and he's the one who justifies. He makes us right with God. And to help you understand the beauty of this passage, I wanna emphasize the three words that were highlighted in what you read. We see, this is what happens to you. 
For those of us who have believed in Jesus, and if you haven't, today, I'm gonna invite you at the end of our service for you to place your faith in Jesus and believe in him. And this is what happens because of who Jesus is when we believe in him. We are justified. And that means, for every word, you're gonna see two things. That means our sin is erased and his righteousness is added justified. You have been justified if you have believed in Jesus. Now, the word justified, the word we just read in the scripture, it's a legal term, and it means to be, to be declared right, to be declared innocent, to be declared just as if you have never sinned. So this is so good. When you believe in Jesus, because Jesus entered this world for you, All of your sin was placed on Jesus and it's no longer on you if you've believed on him, if you've placed your faith in Jesus. It's just as if you have never sinned. It's just as if you have never lied, just as if you have never um, stolen, just as if you've never been unfaithful, just as if you have never had a wrong motivation, just as if you've never been filled with selfishness or pride or lust, just as if the slate is completely clean, just as if you've never sinned. I mean, that's huge. Here's how I know it's huge. Some of you know my past, but before I became a Christian in high school, I was arrested for for stealing things and for being out partying late one night and getting in some crazy trouble with stolen credit cards, getting caught on camera. I mean, it was a mess. And I got arrested and I I stood before, with the two other guys I was with, I stood before a judge to receive a sentence. And it was thankfully a suspended sentence. So six months probation is what I received my senior year in high school. But that moment, standing before the judge. I mean, my knees were knocking because whatever this judge declared, that would be my sentence. And when he said suspended sentence, I mean, relief, relief that I wasn't, that that was gonna be my consequence, that it would just be probation. I mean, relief. But can you imagine how much more relieved I would have been if the judge had looked at me even though I was guilty and declared not guilty. Understand because of Jesus, he has declared those of us who believe in him, he has declared us before our holy God, just as if you've never sinned, not condemned, not guilty. This is what Jesus does for those of us who have believed in him, justified. Oh, the relief, it's huge. So our sin is erased and righteousness added. So it's not only just as if you've never sinned. It's also, it's even better. It's also just as if you've always obeyed, just as if you've always told the truth, just as if you've always been faithful, just as if you've always been the employee, the dad, the mom, the son, the daughter, the friend that you should be, just as if you've always lived perfectly because when Jesus died for you, he took your sin upon himself. And when you believed in him, he gave you all of his righteousness. Not only is the slate clean, but you have the full righteousness of Jesus. He is the justifier. He's justified you. When I was in in Nashville, I coached my youngest daughter's soccer team. We were called the Soccer Rockers. It was awesome. We had a great season. And one game was the game that the kids played the best. I mean, they played the best. They had so much fun. They were so liberated. They played so free. Here's what happened. They were a little nervous before the game. The other team, the whole team didn't show up. And so the refs came over and officially gave us the victory. We won. A couple other kids showed up, some friends. So they said, hey, can we still play? So the ref came back and said, hey, they have enough players now. You won. You won. I've already recorded it. The game is over officially. You won. You have the victory. But would you like to play? The girls were like, yeah, let's play. Let's play. They had such a great time playing because they were not playing to achieve a victory, 
They were playing from the liberation of victory. They were not playing for victory. They were playing from victory. And this is how we get to live. Those of us who are sons and daughters of God, we get to live from the position, from the posture of our forgiveness, of our victory has already been secured by Jesus. We are justified. We are right before God because his anger was satisfied in Jesus on our behalf. You have been justified. This is really good news. Notice the the other word that we read or the second word we read, redemption. You are redeemed and you're redeemed from slavery and for your savior. So we're reading from Romans 3. The Apostle Paul is writing this to people who live in Rome. Romans live in Rome. And in the Roman culture, about a third of Rome was in slavery. But you could be adopted out of slavery and become the son or daughter of nobility. And so that's the image here. And when you were adopted, you were bought, you were redeemed, you went from being a slave to being a son or daughter of nobility. And this is what Jesus did for you. He redeemed you. For those of you who have believed in Jesus, he redeemed you from slavery of your foolishness and your sinfulness and the desires that never quench you and satisfy you. He bought you from that. He didn't only buy you from that. He bought you from that for himself. You've been redeemed from slavery for your savior. So now your relationship with God is not one of you worrying about this angry master who wants to ruin you, but you have a loving and gracious father who is crazy about you. You have been redeemed. All right, now I really wanna spend some time on the third word because this is gonna help you understand the anger of God and why the anger of God is good for you and what God did with his anger towards your sin. This is also later gonna help you deal with your own anger. But today I really want you to wrestle with, because you've probably had friends. You go to church, you you watch mirrors online. What do you do with those verses that God is angry? Is your God loving or is he angry? And this will help you see, I have a loving and gracious God and because he's loving and gracious, he's angered at what destroys me, but he also has dealt with it. So the third word, atonement or mercy seat. And this is the wrath and anger of God satisfied and our sin sent away. So it's both. The anger of God satisfied because Jesus is the mercy seat and our sin sent away. So we read in the verses that we read together that Jesus is the mercy seat. I I really want you to understand this. I, I I need to take you back in time. So in the Old Testament, there was the sacrificial system that was really connected to the tabernacle and the temple that came after the tabernacle. There was the outer court in the tabernacle, the holy place and the most holy place. And in the most holy place, there was the very significant Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant, within the Ark of the Covenant, the 10 commandments, this is where they were stored, the 10 commandments. The 10 commandments are holy. This is the perfect law of God that he wrote for his people And because he's holy and pure, the commandments are holy and pure, but we are not holy and pure. All of us, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have broken the commandments in the Ark of the Covenant. We've all broken commandments. And so those commandments speak against us because we have fallen short. But the mercy seat is above the 10 commandments, because mercy triumphs over judgment. The mercy seat is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. This is the mercy seat right here, or the lid of atonement. And the mercy seat is so important because the mercy seat is where God and man meet. Now, remember in the passage that we are studying in Romans 3, Jesus is the mercy seat. But in the Old Testament, this is the understanding of what the mercy seat is. This is the place where God and man meet. 
In Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, the scripture says, this is God speaking to Moses, I will meet with you there above the mercy seat between the two cherubim. So between the two cherubim, these these angel figures right here, I will meet with you there. Between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you from there about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. So God told Moses, hey, you've wondered if I still wanna meet with people, if I love people, I wanna meet with you. See, all the little G gods of other cultures, they didn't wanna meet with the people. But here's God saying, I love you. I long for a relationship with you and I will meet with you here at the mercy seat. And so people in the Old Testament, when they hear the mercy seat, they know that this is good news, that God still wants to meet with us, even though we have broken all of his commandments, God still longs to know us and for us to know him. But the mercy seat where God and man met, this only happened one day a year in the old tabernacle, the old sacrificial system. This one day a year was known as the day of atonement. So this is the lid of atonement, but on the day of atonement, a high priest would go from the outer court into the holy place and into the most holy place to this very place to meet with God, met with God in this place, in the most holy place. And so if you were back in time and you were watching the events unfold on the Day of Atonement, you knew that the mercy seat was so significant, but you also noticed on this very significant and sacred day that there were two goats and both of the goats were really important to you and it's all related to Jesus being your mercy seat. The first goat is a goat that was actually slaughtered to absorb the anger of God, to symbolically take the anger of God because God's angry because we have sinned and we've fallen short and we've broken the commandments. But here's what happened to that first goat. Leviticus 16, verse 15, when he, when he, the priest, slaughters the male goat, for the people's sin offering and brings its blood inside the curtain. He will do the same with its blood as he did with the bull's blood. So we offered a bull's blood for his own sins, the priest did, but now it's the goat for the people's sins. He's to sprinkle it against the mercy seat and in front of it. So on that day, there was this male goat that was sacrificed. And the people, as they watched this goat sacrificed and the priests go back into the most holy place to where the ark is with the blood from that goat, the people, a sigh of relief. The day of atonement is this cosmic reboot because we have all fallen short of God, but instead of him putting his anger on us, God has put his anger on the sacrifice. The sacrifice, the goat has absorbed all of the anger of God. Relief, there's no anger of God for me because God's anger has been poured out on the sacrifice. And then there was a second goat. And the people were excited to see this goat as well. The priest, after he had placed the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, comes back out from the most holy place. And then he places his hands on the second goat. The scripture says, lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the Israelites' iniquities and their rebellious acts, all their sins. He's to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness. And so if you were there, if you're back in time and you're watching the priest after the first goat was sacrificed, he's gone to the mercy seat with blood from that sacrifice. He now places his hands on the second goat and this goat is sent away. Relief, relief with every step that this goat goes further and further from you, you are reminded that your sin and your shame has been sent away from you, that God has chosen to remove your shame and remove your sin. It's gone, it's in the wilderness. See, Jesus is called in this passage that we're studying, your 
mercy seat. Jesus fully accomplishes all that these images from the Old Testament give us. Jesus is the mercy seat. Jesus is the place where you and God meet. Without Jesus, you can't know God. You can't have a relationship with God without Jesus. Jesus is the mercy seat. He's who bridges humanity and God. Jesus is your mercy seat, the place where you can know God. You don't have, you will not have the peace of God and the joy of God without Jesus. But when you know Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you are united with God. God and man meet. Jesus triumphs over judgment. Jesus is the mercy seat. You and I, we have broken the commandments. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. But when we believe in Jesus, Jesus is our mercy seat who covers all of our sin and our shame. Jesus is the mercy seat. Jesus is the first sacrifice. The reason we do not have a God who is angered at us, for those of us who have believed in Jesus, is because Jesus has absorbed in his flesh all of the anger of God. Maybe you have wrestled and wondered, is God mad at me? Does God want to destroy me? Listen, if you have believed in Jesus, there's no more anger left for you because all of God's anger has been poured out on Jesus on your behalf. And because Jesus loves you so much and pursues you and longs for you to know him, Jesus placed himself on the cross. He could have pulled himself off. He could have called for angels to rescue him, but he placed himself there out of his great love for you. And he absorbed in his flesh all of your sin, all of your shame, all of the anger of God poured out on Jesus. And for six hours on a Friday afternoon, as the pure and blameless Son of God, as the the pure and unblemished sacrifice for our sins, as the pure Lamb of God, Jesus absorbed in His flesh all of our sin and shame and the anger against our sin that should have been ours, Jesus absorbed all of it. And on that cross, he yelled out, it is finished. There's no more payment for your sin because Jesus paid it all if you believe in him. Jesus is the mercy seat. Jesus is the first sacrifice, the one who was slain and slaughtered on the cross for you. And Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus is the second sacrifice. Jesus is the one who is led away. Jesus is the one who was crucified outside of the city gate. He is the one who is led away. Jesus is the one who now has sent your sins away if you have believed in him. If you have believed in Jesus, your sins are removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Jesus is the mercy seat. Jesus is the sacrifice that absorbs the anger and the wrath of God for you. So there's There's none left for you, child of God. And Jesus is the sacrifice that is sent away. So if you have believed in him, your sins and your shame are removed from you forevermore. Jesus is the mercy seat, the mercy seat. And so if you wonder what did God do with his his rightful anger, his righteous anger, here's really good news. God's anger for my sin was absorbed in Him, absorbed in Jesus. Will you say that with me right now? God's anger for my sin was absorbed in Him. If you believe in Jesus, God is not angry. He's not mad. He's not trying to ruin you. There is no more wrath left for you because Jesus absorbed all of it. If you've believed in him, Jesus is your redemption. Jesus is your justification. Jesus is your sacrifice. Jesus is your mercy seat. Jesus is the one who sends your sins away. Jesus is everything for us. Jesus has done all 
to accomplish our forgiveness. Have you believed in him? Have you received his mercy and his grace? Jesus is the mercy seat who offers you mercy for all of your sin, all of your disobedience. Jesus is your mercy seat. Have you believed in him? We're in Romans chapter three today. In Romans chapter 10, verse nine, the scripture says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, forgiven, because Jesus is the sufficient sacrifice for you. Are you ready to believe in Jesus? I don't mean just believe about Jesus, but believe in Jesus, that you'll trust Jesus to take away your sin, that you'll trust Jesus to be the one who brings you back to God. Are you ready to believe in Jesus, to trust in Jesus? If God is speaking to you today, and I believe that he is, and you are ready to say yes to Jesus and thank you, I receive your forgiveness. Pray something like this with me right where you are. Dear God, I know that I have fallen short of your perfect standard. I have broken your commandments and I need your forgiveness. God, thank you for sending Jesus, God the Son, here for me. I place my faith in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Please forgive me. Make me your son, make me your daughter. I believe in Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. This is the most important moment in your life. The moment where instead of trusting yourself, you trust Jesus and you receive his forgiveness. If you prayed that with me a moment ago, we wanna follow up with you, we wanna pray for you, we wanna send you a gift. And so to do that, you simply text BELIEVE to the number on the screen so that we can get in contact with you. If you believed in Jesus today for the first time, right now, text BELIEVE to the number on the screen. There's a God who weeps. There's 
your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, oh glory to God. Who would reach for me?